Welcome. My name is Beth Wellen. I am the director of the Manchester Historical Museum, and I want to thank you for coming. And a special uh, welcome to our guests. We have about 10 non members tonight. Thank you so much for coming, and I hope you like us so much that you'll join and become a member. Um, when you're a member, you get to come to these for free. So it's a good, good thing to do. Um, before we start, just a couple of um, housekeeping things. Um, one, just a reminder. Now that we are in the big, using the bigger hall, we don't have a space limitation for people, but we still would like some RSVPs. We need to know how much food and drink to buy, so please keep calling or emailing in and letting us know our numbers so we um, can be prepared for that. And a couple of things um, coming up. Next month's lecture, David Fay is going to be talking about the Manchester Bath and Tennis Club. They just celebrated their centennial. So we'll be seeing and hearing that wonderful program. Um, but two other things coming up. Also happening in May, we're going to have a wonderful uh, one-week art exhibit, uh, photography. And it's Michael Otis, and it's called Under Sale. There's postcards at both doors. Uh, make sure you pick up one and come by. This will be during the last week of um, May, and the dates here, May 27th through May 29th, um, and there'll be some beautiful photographs, very fitting for entering into the summer here in Manchester. Just a reminder, we do send out email announcements and newsletters. If you're not getting those, can you make sure we get your email if you want them? We do have these postcards at the door about getting signed up for those uh, reminders and you know, like the winter uh, cancellations. Uh, you know, some of you probably saw how uh, um, um, often I had to use that to uh, change our plans. So yes, if you're not getting emails make sure, and you want to, please let us know. And just one other thing, I know we don't have any people of this size here tonight, but we have started family programs at the museum once a month, and the next one that's coming up is on Saturday, April 25th at 10 a.m. And this is for grown-ups and their younger uh, family members, three and up. And yes, it is pre for preschoolers and um, elementary school kids. Usually you can't talk those middle schoolers into coming to anything, so you don't bother. Um, but it's going to be um, Manchester's Maritime. And we have filled up our exhibit um, <coughs> displays with various maritime instruments, maps, charts, and we're gonna have you know, some stories about what was like on Captain Trask's vessel using the diary of the lady who went on board. And um, we'll be making our own little uh, ship model that day for them to take home. And we're gonna be doing this each month of the year, so uh, do pay attention. If you know of little peoples, please bring them. We want, we want younger folks to know that our wonderful museum is for everybody. Um, so. Without further ado, let's get started. I get to introduce the first person, very easy. Actually, we probably don't even need to introduce him. It's our own John Huss. And he's done a wonderful job putting together this presentation about Captain Trask and the St. Petersburg. So I'm gonna hand it over to John. I was afraid he was gonna introduce me as one of the little people. <laughs> Um, it's a great turnout. Thanks a lot for coming, and uh, I especially want to thank uh, the two gentlemen who are going to follow me here at the podium. Uh, uh, they are there the, what this uh, evening is all about. But I'm going to set the stage a little bit, and so here we go. Our saga this evening begins not in Manchester, but rather in Salem. The year is 1788, and an expectant mother named Re Oops, got that. I gotta get this. There she is, my golly. And an expecting mother named Rebecca Trask Tank anxiously awaits the return of her 21 year old husband, John, who is chief mate aboard a merchant ship trading in the West Indies. Her anxiety is well founded, for the death rate among local fishermen and merchant seamen during the 18th and 19th century was appalling. The bad news that Rebecca fears arrives. Her husband John has died of illness in Havana, leaving her widow with a newborn son. The poor woman is so distraught that she suffers a mental breakdown and is unable to raise the child. 
The parents have no desire to take on the task of the baby. Richard Tink is sent to Manchester to be raised in the foster home of a generous and loving family named Lee. There were many different Lee families in Manchester at the time, but we are unable to identify just who were the caring foster parents. Interestingly, interestingly enough, Richard's birth mother, Rebecca Trask Tink, eventually moved from Salem to Manchester herself. But we don't know where she lived or to what degree, if any, she had any contact with the Lee family and her son. We do know, however, that Mr. Lee, Richard's adopted father, was a local fisherman who first took the boy to sea at age 12 aboard a schooner fishing the Grand Banks. Like many young men of that era, Richard had little formal schooling, but while at sea taught himself the fundamentals of navigation, and it is reported, quote, kept a pro forma logbook and practiced writing on the lid of a sea chest and thus formed a hand that was notable for clearness and elegance. <laughs> Soon he qualified to serve as a chief mate. In 1811, at the age of 23, felt successful enough to embark on a new voyage, that of marriage to a Lucy Dennis. I didn't click that quite quickly enough. <laughs> That's that's Lucy, we think. <laughs> Over the next four years, the three children, three children were born, Richard Jr., Lucy, and Mary. Richard's career continued to prosper, and around 1822, he was given his first command, a skipper of the ship Adrian, owned by the Boston Merchant House of Loring and Cunningham. This very successful firm, located at Rose Wharf, sent many of their ships to the Baltic ports and to Russia, an enterprise Richard would capitalize on in years to come. The next chapter in the captain's life begins a year later, in 1823. His wife, Lucy, suddenly dies, leaving Richard to care for their three children, none of whom were yet teenagers. The captain is no fool. Surely there is a marriageable woman somewhere in Manchester who would entertain a proposal from a prosperous local sea captain, even if it meant raising his three young children. And indeed there was. Abigail Hooper, daughter of Joseph Hooper and Abigail Crafts, was the 35-year-old spinster who had operated a very successful general store on North Street for many years. Abby had recently built a house at 10 Union Street and had reestablished her shop on the premises. Here she sold dry goods, tea, coffee, condiments, clothing, including bonnets that she herself designed and made, and according to her well-kept ledgers, lots and lots and lots of wine and spirits. <laughs> she was quite a remarkable woman. In addition to running her shop, Abby treated the sick with homeopathic medicines and acted as an attorney by drawing up wills and deeds. <laughs> Tall, straight, slender, with a commanding air, she could certainly hold her own in any marriage, including one with the formidable Captain Richard Tate. So in 1823, the two were married, but not before <coughs> Abby got Richard to sign a document stating that the new house and all its contents would forever remain in her name. <laughs> and that wasn't all. <laughs> Apparently sensitive to the possible confusion between the names Tink and Stink. <laughs> Strong-willed Abby then persuaded the captain to apply to the state legislature to have his name changed to Trask, his mother's maiden name. On June 20th, 1826, the general court decreed that Richard Tink of Manchester, Master Mariner, may take the name of Richard Trask, and then his wife may take the name of Abigail Cooper Trask. The couple had one child, son Charles, born in 1824. One of the treasures we have in the museum's collection is this little, I've got to stop doing that, is this little watercolor portrait painted on ivory of Captain Trask. You will notice that some of the paint is worn away over time. <laughs> On the back is this inscription, written and signed by Abby. This likeness of Mr. Trask, and she calls her husband Mr., which ladies, take note of. 
Now this likeness of Mr. Trask was painted in 1825 in Marseille, and it was defaced by Chas kissing it when he was a babe. Aww. Apparently, whenever the captain was away at sea, Abby would take the portrait up to little Charlie's bedroom so he could give Daddy a good night kiss. And now it's time for, oh, now it's time for us to return to see ourselves. In 1825, Captain Trask had accumulated the means to purchase his own vessel, the brig Edward, which he intended to sail to Russia on behalf of the famous Boston trading firm of Enoch Train and Company. Unfortunately, the Edward was lost at, off the Bahamas, but other vessels were soon acquired by Enoch Train, with Trask serving as master, ma as master to embody the responsibilities of both captain and merchant. Outward cargoes were generally Havana, sugar, and American cotton, and once sold in Russia, the proceeds were reinvested in Russian hemp, sailcloth, and goose feathers, the latter much sought after as writing instruments back in America. Trask also brought home samples of the latest fashions from London, and Abigail's shop as well. Doing my research for this talk, I came upon this fascinating book about the Western Ocean Packets. My interest was rewarded not only because of the many references to Captain Trask and his ship to St. Petersburg, but also because the clipper ship shown at the bottom of the cover is the famous Dreadnought, once sailed by my great-great-grandfather, Captain Samuel Sandals of New York. <laughs> Packets helped write a thrilling chapter in the maritime history of the United States during the mid-19th century. While they carried some cargo and mail, they were primarily passenger ships, transporting wealthy Americans across the Atlantic to Europe and returning with literally millions of immigrants. Competition between the rival packet lines was fierce, speed of crossing being the paramount concern. Most sailed out of the port of New York, but Boston was well represented by Enoch Train and Company. Here we see the house flag of Enoch's train's white diamond line on the second row. You had to be a tough taskmaster to command the Atlantic packets, and no one was tougher than my ancestor, Captain Samuels, who was featured in this advertisement for the Atlantic Insurance Company. It depicts Captain Samuels single-handedly quelling a mutiny on board the Dreadnought with the help of his loyal dog, Wallace. <laughs> While in command of a ship named the Saratoga, Captain Trask had a very similar accounting encounter, according to Lovett, the author of the book. I'll leave this image on the screen. Just imagine it's now Richard Trask, not Captain Samuels, with a loaded revolver. <laughs> Here's Lubbock's account. Quote, Captain Trask was another of those iron-willed, iron-nerved skippers who could deal with a tough crew. On one occasion, he left off with a forecastle full of French convicts just out of jail. One was openly mutinous. Trask immediately put him in irons. At this, the rest came out, bent on making trouble. Trask ordered his son, the second mate, to draw a line across the deck, pulled out his revolver, and told the crew that he would shoot the first to cross that line. Now, this reference to a son is certainly not Charles, who never pursued a maritime career, so it had to be Trask's son Richard by his first marriage. In any event, looking down the barrel of the captain's revolver, None of the mutineers dared cross the line, and all 18 were put into irons and chained to the deck of Trask's cabin. Lubbock concludes his account by envisioning Trask <coughs> fast asleep on the cabin settee, wholly indifferent to the scowling faces and wriggling forms of the 18 mutineers on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have good reason to believe that the settee mentioned is in fact this one in our collection, oh, wow. which family members say was built especially for and used by Trask aboard his ships. It is a massive piece of furniture, but it had to be. Captain Richard Trask weighed close to 300 pounds. <laughs> in 1839, Captain Trask joined the Enoch Train Company as a one-quarter owner and skipper of a brand new packet to St. Petersburg the largest ship ever built in Massachusetts at the time. His share of the cost was $15,000, as shown in this bill of sale. 
She was built at the Waterford and Yule Boatyard in Medford. Weighed 840 tons and was 168 feet overall with a beam of 33 feet. At this time, as many as 350 men were working in the many Medford shipyards. And by the time the boat building industry had run its course, 568 ships had been launched in Medford and towed down the Mystic River at high tide to the wharves in Boston. Here we see the Waterford and Jules final ship, the Pilgrim, just before launch. It was customary for the town to give the local school a half holiday to celebrate the completion of a new ship. And one lucky youngster recalls the day the St. Petersburg was launched in 1839. <coughs> How beautiful the brightly painted ship with her graceful outlines appeared to me. And with what a thrill I saw the last block knocked away and the slowly increasing movement of the mighty mass. I can still see the hundred stalwart men on the shore manning the great hawsers, checking and guiding the vessel as she swings into the stream on her way to Boston. The St. Petersburg was indeed a beauty. With her handsome square stern painted ports, rich mahogany fittings below, and her officer's service of Russian cut glass and solid silver, she won attention and admiration wherever she went. Upon her arrival at port, crowds would often gather to board the St. Petersburg and marvel at her grand furnishings and appointments. In his book, Basil Lubbock describes Trask as one of those princely owner skippers with a grand manner. Wherever he went, he entertained largely. And it's even stated that as soon as he had arranged, as soon as he had arranged for his return cargo, he would leave the ship in charge of the first officer and return via London by steam. <laughs> <laughs> the St. Petersburg has been, was named to honor the various members of the imperial family of Russia, who became personal friends of Captain Tras during his various voyages to that country. The captain would sometimes return with gifts, including this French lithograph showing a view of St. Petersburg, as well as a diamond ring from Tsar Alexander II. One day, young Charlie Trask, seen here in silhouette at age eight, got hold of the ring and scratched his initials on a window pane outside his bedroom. They are still visible at the Trask house today. As a further tribute to his Russian friends, Trask arranged for the figurehead of the St. Petersburg to be a bust of Tsar Nicholas I of Russia. In the spring of 1840, Captain Trask pers persuaded Abigail to accompany him to England aboard his fine new ship. The St. Petersburg lay in Mobile being loaded with cotton when her passengers Abigail, 12-year-old Charlie, and Abby's lifelong female companion, Louisa Lord, arrived from Boston to board for the transatlantic crossing. This was Abigail's first such a voyage, and it was not a happy one. <laughs> Louisa Lord was almost a daughter to Abigail, kept a daily diary of the trip, including this entry on May 20th, just their second day at sea. Mrs. T suffered some from seasickness all day. She is very weak, debilitated by her stay in Mobile. Some of the sailors came on board very drunk and brought their kegs and jugs of rum and whiskey with them, which the mate took away and threw overboard. <laughs> Throughout the voyage, 40 days to Liverpool, 34 days returning. Poor Abigail was sick nearly every day. Oh. And not surprisingly, never set foot on a ship again. <laughs> <laughs> For Louise's daily account, I commend her diary. Excuse me. I commend her diary, uh, which was published by the uh, Historical Society back in 1975. It makes wonderful reading. We have it available in the museum. With Richard Trask in command of the St. Petersburg, the ship made three voyages to London, uh, Liverpool and three to Russia. As large and handsome as she was, the St. Petersburg was neither a lucky ship nor as profitable as Enoch Train and Company had envisioned. On January 13, 1843, she was struck by a sudden and intense storm off the coast of England and driven aground. Thankfully, no lives were lost, but the cargo was ruined and the eventual repairs proved both time consuming and costly. Four days after the wreck, Richard wrote a long letter to Abigail describing the ordeal. My dear wife, I believe that every soul aboard 
had made up his mind we would never see the light of another day. But God is merciful and kind to us in delivering us from the jaws of death and brought us safe to land again. Oh, my dear, this has been a trying, trying time for me, but God has saved my life, and I desire to praise him for his goodness in me. While well, repairs were being made, estimated at $35,000, Captain Trask commissioned an unknown British artist to paint this dramatic oil, which is now on display in our museum. A year later, Captain Trask received this certificate in appreciation for his $20 donation to the American Seamen's Friends Society. His large yes being enough to qualify for life membership in this benevolent association. <laughs> In 1845, the St. Petersburg completed one final voyage with Trask in command, returning with refugees from Ireland, escaping the potato famine. Well, we don't know how many of these immigrants the St. Petersburg could carry. It was not uncommon for as many as five to six hundred to be crowded below the decks on the larger packs. Following that voyage, Captain Trask retired from the sea, but not from the business remaining an active investor in Enoch Training Company's line of Boston to Liverpool patents. He came home to live in Manchester, but was apparently never comfortable in his surroundings. In addition to running her shop, Abigail had for many years been taking young ladies into her home, teaching them the domestic arts. It was clearly a woman's world. <laughs> so to provide her husband some solitude, Abigail had a small room built in the attic seen here just above the chimney, where Richard could retreat and look out over the village to the harbor and his beloved ocean beyond. In 1846, Captain Trask passed away at the age of only 59, apparently succumbing to cholera, contracted during one of his final voyages. At his death, all the ships in Boston Harbor flew their flags at half mast in his honor. And here in Manchester, it was generally agreed that the town has lost, had lost its largest citizen, both in terms of wealth and size. <laughs> Abigail lived to be 96, the oldest resident in Manchester at the time of her death, and unquestionably one of the town's most respected citizens. Both Abigail and Richard Trask are buried in the Union Cemetery on School Street, their plot well marked by this impressive monument. As for the St. Petersburg, she apparently was sold by Enoch Train and Company, and her bad luck continued. In 1856, returning to the States from Bombay, India, she began to sink and was abandoned at sea. Happily for the Manchester Historical Museum, the story does not end here. Last year, I guided my good friend Steve Parson through the Trask House. Steve, a history buff, author, and crackerjack sailor, was fascinated by the story of Captain Trask in the St. Petersburg and offered to build a half model of the ship for our permanent collection. It was a wonderful offer, which we were quick to accept. Please welcome Steve Parson for the rest of the story.